Uh, rising stars are one of the more stable uh, economies in West Africa, and so is kind of considered a regional superpower along with Nigeria. Um, it's been relatively stable for a long time and has a, a, a pretty you know, good government that uh, tries to do a lot of things for its people. Uh, this is uh, what Ghana looks like as a country. Accra on the coast is the capital where everyone flies into. And then uh, for the uh, trip to Ghana, we spend most of our time in Kumasi, which is uh, the second city in Ghana. It's the second most populated city. Uh, it is the um, capital of the, I'm going to say this wrong, help me out here, Dr. Benson. Uh, Ashanti people, thank you, uh, which uh, they were uh, renowned for their wealth in gold. Uh, so it's a, it's a pretty culturally interesting city because of that. Uh, during the month that we sp that you spend in uh, Ghana, during the course, we also go up to uh, Mole National Park, which is near Tamala, and we go down to the coast uh, and explore uh, some various different regions of the country of Ghana. So what are we doing there? Um, so uh, when when we take the trip to Ghana, uh, Dr. Benson, along with uh, Dr. Uh, Ty Dickerson, uh, who's in the Department of Pediatrics and also uh, the Director of uh, Global Health for the School of Medicine, um, they have been coming here for years and have been developing uh, projects. So what I would say, if you, if anyone is thinking, gosh, I want to do a global study abroad, or I want to uh, I want to learn something about West Africa or about, about Ghana. What you're going to learn here, the value of going to Ghana, is, is learning what is feasible in global health and what can be done and what's involved with that. So every year, uh, Dr. Dickerson and Dr. Benson pick about six different programs that, uh, that they put on that they are working alongside the uh, students at KNUST, which is the local medical school. So. In this picture, what you're seeing is I'm the little white head in the background, and then we've got a, a couple of our undergraduate uh, students who came along uh, that were working with me, and they were uh, a, a great time. And then all of the all of the taller people of darker skin tone are actually the medical students, and it's uh, there's some medical students, there's some uh, pharmacy students. Um, it's it's kind of a wide uh, breadth of of young. Uh, professional students that come along. So we're working alongside with these guys on a daily basis. And then, as you can see, there's kids. And so you know, if your goal is to go to a, the developing world and play with kids, this is going to be a good trip for you. But uh, what Dr. Dickerson and Dr. Uh, Benson do every year is they pick about five to seven different projects that, uh, that the people of the area that they're working in want to work on to develop the uh, healthcare system within that area. And then they assign different groups to each project. And you really get a sense of what it takes to do global health in the real world. You know, what it takes when you're coming from America with, you know, whatever limited resources you can bring with you and the knowledge that you may have, and then going to another country, another society, another culture, and trying to work with them and seeing you know what you can feasibly get done, and you know sometimes what maybe can't get done. So it's a great uh, experience to learn you know in reality what global health is all about. It's not uh, it's not duffel bag medicine. Uh, you know it's not we're going to show up and we're going to you know give a hundred people uh, you know some antihypertensive medicine, and then we're never going to see them again. It's something that they've been doing now for nine years or. 10 years now, um, and so it's so. What, what's fun is when you talk to Dr. Dickerson or when you talk to Dr. Benson or when you talk to some of the people involved from KNUSD who've been involved for a long time, and you start to realize like, oh yeah, when we first came here, this village didn't have electricity. Or when we first came here, you know, there was no health care in this area. And, you know, look at what they have now compared to what they didn't have 10 years ago. So one of the big uh, things that the University of Utah has done in uh, the region, uh, the Barak Kese region of, uh, of uh, Ghana that we go to, is they've actually physically built three uh, healthcare centers that are these community-based health uh, planning and services, or CHIPS compounds. And so a lot of the work that we're doing in this area are involved with uh, these compounds, which are staffed by nurses and by nurse midwives. Um, 
and do a lot of the local uh, health care for the for the area that we're working in. And so the project that I worked on, uh, we split up into groups, and what we were doing is we were interviewing the local populations around these ship's compounds about uh, their health care usage and, and whether or not they've been using these compounds that, you know, that the University of Utah has built and that has been staffed by uh, health care professionals through the, through the government of Ghana and what kind, trying to figure out what kind of barriers to access there are and uh, what kind of other options people are using um, and who is, who's using it, who's the target audience that, that these compounds are being uh, used for. And so uh, this was the group that I was going around with and so what we would do is we would, uh, we came up with a list of questions that we wanted to ask. We then had to uh, translate it into Twi, which is the local language. And uh, so my two medical students who knew a lot more Twi than I did would uh, communicate with the, with the participants and uh, ask the questions and then they had the uh, not so fun job of having to re-listen to all the recordings that we made and then transcribe them into uh, English so that we could actually code the information that we were seeking. So we're, we actually, the best way we found to use this is using the voice memo uh, mode on, uh, on cell phones. So he's uh, sitting there with the cell phone recording uh, the questions and the answers given by the, by the participant. So, uh, as I said before, um, if you want to play with uh, incredibly cute young kids uh, in a developing world, um, there are a lot of kids. There are a lot of kids. A lot of them are really adorable. And uh, so usually, I believe every year you guys do some sort of pediatric base for the most part. So, you know, different, uh, they have different programs, so you can kind of pick one that best suits what your interests are. Uh, they did one on uh, stunting and growth uh, based on kids, uh, which was kind of a follow-up to a, a study that they did about worm load in, in kids in, the, in this area. And then, of course, you know, we also get to do some fun things here. So we're on, we're on safari. We're actually on the top of a, uh, of a Land Rover uh, safari vehicle here. Uh, so we're having uh, fun uh, looking at elephants and uh, getting close to elephants. And we got to, and we got to go on a, uh, on a uh, canopy walk tour through the rainforest. And we got to learn about the local culture. This is the oldest mosque in, uh, in Ghana. And so we got to tour uh, around the mosque and learn about uh, the culture of the Muslim faith uh, in uh, Ghana. And uh, this is actually a view from uh, the Fort Metal Cross in Dix Cove. And so this was, uh, this is actually the town of Dix Cove here, which is a big fishing community. And the fort that we, that we got to tour, uh, Metal Cross, some of us just went uh, on our own uh, and um, got to tour that on a day off that we had. And this was a, a fort that was used in the slave trade. So this is where you know we we know a lot about uh, slavery as its as its effects were in in the Caribbean and in uh, North America. But this was um, the other side of the story and what happened, how these people got captured and got put into into these slave forts and then were eventually brought to the New World. And of course, we got to enjoy a few days at one of the most beautiful beaches uh, in Buswa and got to try our hand at some surfing in, in Buswa. So, uh, so it's, a, it's a really good trip. Uh, Ghana, I've been all over the world and Ghana is definitely a very uh, unique place and I think it's a great learning experience uh, for you know, learning about global health. So uh, thanks. Um, <clears throat> now, uh, I'll introduce Dr. Daniel Wong, is an attending physician in our infectious disease division here at the University of Utah. He was recently recruited here after doing uh, a research fellowship and a number of uh, research opportunities in Bangladesh. I'm going to let him introduce him himself here momentarily, 
but uh, it's been fantastic working with Daniel. He works in our travel clinic with us and seeing people that are returning travelers that are bringing diseases that may not be as well recognized in Utah um, from other places in the world. So, Dr. Long, uh, Daniel, I'll turn the time over to you. And uh, thank you. So, uh, affiliated with Massachusetts General Hospital in Harvard, uh, but actually I, I only spent about one week a year uh, in Boston, uh, and the rest in Bangladesh. So, the, this presentation will be uh, in three parts. One is introduction to Bangladesh and ICDDRB, which is the um, it stands for International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research Bangladesh. So it's a, it used to be called the Cholera Hospital. Um, the second session will be on cholera immunology, and I'm, I'm much more a basic scientist, uh, and, and the CDC might call me a laboratorian. Uh, I have a lab up in the School of Medicine, uh, and then, and so I will try not to bore you with the basic science, but try to bring some translation immunology project that we were uh, working on. And then the last part, if there's time, will be a small project on non typhoidal salmonella epidemiology uh, that was there. Um, diarrhea is still important. Uh, it's about 90% of child deaths in the world are, um, uh, sorry, that, that due to pneumonia and diarrhea occur in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, it's about 1.2 million from pneumonia and about 800,000 from diarrhea, uh, which are improvements uh, over the last decade, but certainly uh, significant numbers. Uh, Bangladesh has about 160 million people in an area the size of Iowa. I didn't really believe it, so I looked it up, and according to this website, uh, if you overlap Iowa and Bangladesh, they are about, they're about the same area. So it's a very crowded place. Uh, scenes like this are not staged. Uh, you, wherever you go, you see people. Um, this happens to be a recent picture from the newspaper. Uh, there's a gathering of pilgrims outside the city, that happens every year, uh, but there are a lot of people. Uh, it is a, you know, a low-income country uh, that is 87% Muslim, 12% Hindu, and the other 1% are Buddhists and Christians. Uh, the official language in Bengali, and they are very proud uh, of uh, their language. Uh, and <clears throat> This is the, the map of Bangladesh. You can see Dhaka right in the middle there. Uh, this is, that is the city where I stayed uh, for the four years. Uh, and it, it borders uh, the India on three sides, as well as Myanmar uh, on the southeast. Diarrhea happens in Bangladesh. Uh, this is a study that was published about 10 years ago, uh, and it was a study of an area called Mirzapur, which is semi-rural Bangladesh, uh, and the x-axis is the number of episodes of diarrhea that a child uh, over the first two years of life has, and y-axis is the percentage of children. So the majority of children have between um, 3 and 13 uh, episodes of diarrhea over their first two years of life, with the median uh, around 6 to 8. And the duration of the diarrhea episodes, uh, it, it's, it's between 0 and about 2 weeks. So uh, for much of their first two years of life, these children have diarrhea. Uh, there are seasonalities. The, the March peak, uh, our March April peak uh, is a cholera peak preceded by an ETEC peak, and then there is a October peak that comes most years. It didn't come two years ago. It came this year in December. That is kind of the post monsoon cholera peak, uh, and there it is an interesting um, that in Bangla in Dhaka, for example, you have two peaks of cholera, but in Kolkata there's only one, and uh, it speaks to really how seasonality depends on the geography. What is the International Center for Diarrheal Disease Research? Well, it was established in 1960 as a cholera research laboratory. Uh, it, it now is trying to get it cholera kind of out of its name, even though it's historically it's been the focus. Um, it the, it ha is features the has the world's longest running field site in Matlab uh, that's been going on since 1963. Uh, it's uh, many of the physicians there are, are um, credited with. Uh, pioneering the use of ORS and zinc for diarrheal diseases. Uh, many of them, uh, there's been many guidelines that for treating um, severely malnourished kids that have been uh, developed in co cooperation with scientists at ICDDRB. Uh, and in the recent um, years especially, they've sent many teams all over the world to uh, Africa, places like Zimbabwe uh, and um, uh, Haiti and the Philippines uh, in order to educate the locals in those places on how to combat cholera. 
Takdaka Hospital has uh, established an EMR uh, and gone paperless since 2008, uh, and also in that way has uh, quite a trove of uh, good electronic records uh, for looking at diarrheal diseases uh, and doing epidemiologic uh, um, investigations. So th this is a infographic of ICDRB in 2013 out of their annual report. They have about $67 million in revenue, uh, about $42 million of which, which are research grants from over 200 funders, uh, five uh, governments, including uh, Canada, uh, Australia, UK, Bangladesh, and Sweden, um, have contributed unrestricted funds to, for the operation of its hospital. If you look at the lower right, uh, that is the, the numbers from the hospital, 180,000 people treated uh, for last year over uh, two hospitals. A, mo a third of the patients make less than $5 a day, and these are a lot of the slum dwellers uh, who live in slums very close to the hospitals and the treatment center. Uh, and 55% of, the, of these uh, patients are under five. <clears throat> this is a, um, oh, I'm not hooked up um, audio-wise, but this is a, uh, let me just stop this. I will let it play, and I'll describe it later. Can you hear this? It's incredible that they can put uh, peripheral lines in houseless patients, these, these nurses here. Sorry about the, the audio there, but uh, that was a documentary that uh, Al Jazeera was filming during my first year there uh, featuring this cholera hospital. Uh, and you can see that cholera uh, is, is a disease that can uh, kill a previously healthy 20-something-year-old uh, within hours. Uh, and, and this patient who started having diarrhea in the morning collapsed uh, and uh, was postless by the time he got to our hospital uh, is, is a... Is, is a Example of that, uh, and however, the good news is that if you get to our hospital with a pulse, and many without a pulse, you leave with a pulse. That if you get to treatment in time with cholera, uh, and and the a treatment center that has a good protocol and experience with treating cholera, uh, the results are frequently very good. So these are some pictures of the cholera hospital, which is the ICCDRB DACA hospital, uh, and you can see that. You can see the wards on, on the bottom, and I, I'll, I won't go into very in detail, but uh, it is a very efficient system. You see that you don't really see any nurses in this shot, is because there's probably one nurse for every 100 patients. Uh, and the, their job is to take vitals, uh, to uh, dispense medications, uh, but it is the job of the uh, caregiver of each patient. So each patient arrives with a family member uh, to see how much stool is output, and I'll show you how we calculate stool output, uh, and then 
to put the same amount of ORS back into the patient. Uh, and there are stations uh, near the nursing station that have uh, ORS in big jugs, uh, and the, each patient attendant brings their own cup of uh, or container uh, to fill, and, and that's you know, really how patients are hydrated after the initial IV hydration. And not everyone needs intravenous hydration for cholera. Now, this is the mainstay of cholera treatment. It's the cholera cot. Uh, this and ORS. It is a, a very effective way of uh, measuring how much stool output there is. It's a plastic liner on top of uh, a you know, wooden, uh, really a wooden bed, uh, and uh, there's a chute down towards the bucket, and that bucket gets measured every few hours to determine the the, the loss of uh, fluids. Uh, and the, the fluid loss can be up to one liter an hour, uh, and we've certainly had patients who've had more than 50 liters over two or three days uh, uh, that we ha had to replenish. This is a, a, a um, kind of the, the a, an algorithm for treating uh, cholera patients who come in with dehydration. And you can see that only those who are very lethargic and conscious, sunken eyes, with, and and really classified as severe dehydration uh, is rapid IV hydration called for. That those who have some dehydration or no dehydration really are uh, uh, ORS is, is the mainstay. So let me go on to some of the research that I've been able to uh, participate in in DACA. Uh, it centers around cholera and it centers around children with cholera as well as why the vaccine is not very effective in young children. This is the group that I worked with. Uh, this is a picture from about five years ago. Since that time, the group has grown to about twice that size, over 100 people working on cholera research group. This ICDRB has um, several thousand employees, uh, and, and including 200 scientists. And so our group is just one of those research groups that work at ICDRB. Uh, and, and this is a collaboration between um, Massachusetts General Hospital and ICDRB. One, one page on cholera, uh, liver cholera is the bacterium that's responsible for cholera. There's two zero groups, uh, 001 and 0139, that uh, cause epidemic cholera. It's acute dehydrating diarrhea. Uh, this is not a normally a persistent diarrhea. It comes on very quickly. There's a lot of fluid loss, and death is by hypovolemic shock. Approximately 3 million cases worldwide a year, 100,000 deaths. Uh, it is endemic in 50 countries. I show you a map of the endemic countries as published in the bulletin of the WHO a couple of years ago. Uh, I've circled Bangladesh, but you can see that most of Asia and, and much of Africa are endemic for cholera. In Africa, you might hear the term acute watery diarrhea. Uh, that is frequently cholera. Uh, it may also be ETEC, but uh, that is frequently a word for cholera that governments like to use so they do not have to report cholera um, due to the stigma that it causes. So let me just go over a couple of the vaccines that are available for cholera. The first one has been around for probably three decades now. It's Ducoral. It's a whole cell killed vaccine that is supplemented with a recombinant B subunit of the toxin. That makes it difficult due to a couple of reasons. One is the cost. So a recombinant protein in a vaccine makes it, uh, you know, two doses might cost you $20. Uh, and you also need to take it with a buffer. So while it is available in Canada and Europe and many um, uh, developed or high-income countries, this is not a feasible solution for low-income countries. The International Vaccine Institute, uh, funded by various organizations and including the WHO, has uh, produced a kind of a next-generation cholera vaccine called Shankol. Uh, it's a bivalent, so it covers O1 and O139 uh, vaccine. It does not contain the B subunit, and they found that through various studies in the 70s uh, of vaccine trials in Bangladesh that including the toxin in the vaccine actually does not help its efficacy. And so they've developed this no need for a buffer and much cheaper, and it's only a couple of dollars for the two doses. The, the Shankol is the vaccine that is stock being stockpiled by the WHO in case of uh, kind of humanitarian emergencies, uh, and it, this was directly in response to what happened in Haiti, where there was not a stockpile and it was difficult to uh, get a vaccine out, even if they wanted to. So what do we know about cholera in young children? That compared to older persons, uh, there is, the young children have a higher burden. This is a study from, of uh, three different cities that are endemic for cholera, uh, and 
you can see that the red and the blue bars are the children under five and that their incidence is higher than the gray bars, which are the incidence of cholera in those over five years. So uh, it, it, they, they definitely have a higher burden of disease. In terms of protective immunity after natural infection, so if you get cholera, how long are you protected? It's estimated by mathematical model that, that it is three to 10 years. The only really study that we can get good data of was uh, a look back at, the, uh, at a trial in the 1970s looking at, at three years of follow-up, how many kids uh, compared to older children got cholera. And the estimate is that after natural infection, about 65% of kids under five are protected at three years' time. And this same efficacy is for those over five. So in conclusion from this study was that kids under five and over five likely have a similar protective efficacy after natural infection. However, uh, why are we worried about the vaccine? Well, this is a Cochrane review of uh, Ducarol efficacy. And in children over five, it is 66% efficacy. And children under five is 38%. So this is not good. That a 38% efficacious vaccine, oral vaccine, uh, which is good in adults, 68% is, is, is decent, is actually what um, oral typhoid vaccine is, uh, efficacy is. Um, but the 38% certainly is not good. And the, the Shankar vaccine, uh, the five-year follow-up just got published in Lancet last year, uh, 68 to 74% in those over five, and just 42% in those under five. So even with this new generation vaccine that seems to be doing better long term, uh, that kids are not uh, being protected very well. So the problem is that young children compared to older persons have a higher burden of disease. While they have similar protection from natural infection, that the oral cholera vaccine have a lower protection. <clears throat> so you know, the, the question we came up with was, how does an immune response to cholera differ between older and younger children? Uh, and this is important uh, because we see that in vaccine trials there's a difference and we see that children have a higher burden. Uh, obviously, uh, there needs to be some investigation. And I think I have some time to take you some, through some of the key humoral responses. I, I, realize, I recognize that many of you are not basic scientists, uh, but if you'll just bear with me for a little bit so that you can understand some of the subsequent slides. Uh, the primary response upon a, either vaccination or infection your B cells differentiate into plasma cells or antibody secreting cells that secrete antibody. There is a subset of B cells that differentiate into memory B cells. And that is part of the idea behind vaccination is that some of the B, your B cells will differentiate into memory B cells. And years later, when you see the antigen again, uh, these memory B cells will differentiate into uh, plasma cells to secret antibody in a much rapid, more rapid uh, way than your first uh, and look at the antigen. So it is called an animistic response and is a rapid uh, production of antibody due to the memory B cell um, proliferation. In cholera, what we know is that at around day seven, there's a peak of antibody secreting cell responses uh, that at day, oh, around seven to 28, there's a peak of antibody responses. And that these, memory, that these responses of both antibody and antibody secreting cells come back down to undetectable levels by around six months, uh, three to six months. However, the memory B cell response in purple is the response that actually lasts a long time, uh, months to years. So we were interested in looking at the antibody, the memory B cell responses in both natural infection and vaccination. So ICDRB has a very good infrastructure to do these kind of studies because it has the patients, but it also has a very uh, well-organized teams of field staff and scientists that work uh, on, on these studies. So in our natural infection cohort, we recruited children aged two years and above to DACA hospital, and uh, they were all had to be stool culture positive for cholera, uh, and we drew blood at days two, which is when they were confirmed to be positive for cholera, uh, day seven and day 30. We actually have data for day 90 and up to one year, uh, but we don't have enough numbers to present it. What we do with the blood is we Take out the, we split it down uh, with FICOL. We take out the plasma and we do ELISAs to look at antibody responses. And then we take out the cells uh, and do antibody secreting cell responses and uh, memory B cell responses through an LA spot assay. You don't really need to know what that is, but it is a good way uh, and a fairly inexpensive way to enumerate how many uh, memory B cells there are in the blood from taking out the cells. So really 
quickly, I will go over uh, that the, the, this graph on the left is the, is the uh, antibody response for children aged 3 to 5 years. In the middle is children 6 to 17 years. And on the right uh, is the antibody response for adults uh, aged 18 to 60 years. So this is young children, older children, and adults. And you can see that for antibody responses that young children and older children and adults have approximately the same, uh, This is and this is antitoxin, and this is also seen for other antigens, same antibody response. It has approximately the same antibody secreting cell responses and also very similar memory B cell responses. One might make a, a, a case that adults have slightly higher memory B cell responses, but it, we really couldn't find a statistical significantly difference. Um, so how we concluded was that in natural infection, so in cholera, in, in, in coming into our, our, our hospital cholera, that young children mount about the same kind of immune responses as older children and adults. And you might say, well, this is what's expected. This is, um, you know, in natural infection, young children and older children do about this as well uh, at three years' time in terms of protection from cholera. So we then asked, what about children who get the vaccine? So we enrolled 40 children who got the cholera vaccine, and they would come in, get their blood drawn, get the vaccine, come back at three days, get the blood drawn again, come back at 14 days, get the second dose of vaccine, and then come back at seven and 30 days after that and get more blood drawn. Uh, and what we found was interesting. We found that, first of all, so let me orient you, is the blue box uh, it, are the vaccinees, and this is the young vaccinees and old vaccinees. And you can see that there's no difference between a young, younger vaccinees and older vaccinees for antibody response to the vaccine. Uh, what was different, and, and sorry, I guess I see with blue box, is that at the patients, the young and the old, as I showed you, didn't have any differences, but there's huge differences between the young vaccinees and the patients. So what we found out was that, well, we couldn't figure out why the vaccine was different in younger children, but we did find out that the vaccine does not do even close to as good a job as uh, natural infection in terms of mounting antibody responses. And this could be also be seen for both IgG and IgA, and also the memory B cell responses. So you can see that uh, young children really didn't mount, uh, sorry, children vaccinated didn't mount good memory B cell responses, but cholera patients did. So this was somewhat disappointing no difference between young and old, but there's a big difference in vaccine efficacy. So uh, I would just summarize in that in infection is comparable in young and old, and in vaccination is also comparable in young and old, but that in infection uh, they have much, sorry, that the vaccines have much lower responses than in infection. So then we ask, what about T cells? Now, it, it, it really is, uh, um, a, a, I, I think, uh, a testimony of, of what can be done in terms of basic science in, in, in a developing country or a low-income country uh, when we can get a very good flow cytometer. This is the same equipment that the University of Utah Flow Cytometry Core has. It's a fax area 2. It's a sorter. You can do 13 colors on it. And we can look at T cell responses uh, in just as good a, as, a way as we can in, in Boston, in Utah. Uh, and this just this machine lives just about 100 feet from where the cholera patients are getting the blood drawn. So this is what part of the reason that uh, I, I encouraged me to stay there for four years. It was the opportunity to do good science uh, in a place that has the disease, a good basic science uh, in a place that has the disease. Because there's there's um, so we use a method called fascia, and you really don't need to know what that is, except that it looks at T cell responses in response to and antigen stimulation. And we got blood at about the same time points as we did for the antibody uh, studies. So what we found was that uh, that child patients had very good memory T cell responses. And uh, you know, the, the, the bars, the gray bars, are day seven responses. And that's when it, the memory T cell response peaks. Uh, and the, the beta 7, the CCR9, those are gut homing markers, and um, they basically tell us that these T cells we're detecting in the periphery are likely ones that had been in the gut or are going to the gut, so uh, they're important. Uh, however, when you look at vaccinees, older vaccinees seem to have detectable memory T cell responses, but younger vaccinees did not. There was just no uh, statistical significant uh, rise in memory T cell responses. So that, that was the first clue 
that younger children did not have CT-specific, toxin-specific memory T cell responses compared to older vaccinees. Then we looked at cytokines. Uh, we'll skip that. There are various cytokines, Th1, Th2, you might have remembered from your immunology class. Uh, and basically, what we want is a good Th1 and Th17 responses uh, for, uh, in order to get good vaccine responses, and we want, don't want good regulatory T cell responses. Uh, so we did something called Luminex, which is a uh, kind of multi-cytokine array. Again, it, it, it's, uh, it has a, you know, the, the, the other piece of equipment costs $300,000. The Luminex machine doesn't cost as much, but it is also uh, a kind of a, a very good piece of equipment to look at cytokine responses. And first of all, we looked at inferon gamma, which is a TH1 response. And you can see that there is a difference between younger children, so this is day 21 from the younger vaccinees, and this is day 21 of older vaccinees, that there is a significant difference between age groups for the vaccinees in terms of T cell responses, um, these are TH1 responses to the vaccine. You can see that child patients have an even better response, but um, we, we kind of knew that. And then when you look at TH2 responses, same thing, that younger vaccinees had not a, a, a lower uh, TH2 response. I'll jump ahead to TH17 response, which uh, we can see very similarly that uh, younger children actually have very poor uh, IL-17 responses. This is kind of a gut a, a response that helps with kind of gut inflammation and uh, and that older vaccinees uh, had uh, better than younger vaccinees, uh, and, and so on. So, but the bottom line is that in B cell responses, what you usually see as antibody responses, we really didn't see big differences between young and old, but that in T cell responses, we did see that, and we wouldn't be, have been able to see that if we didn't have a full cytometer in Bangladesh. Uh, so that's one of the, one of our uh, kind of, major findings from our, our team's work there is that maybe it is in the T cell responses uh, that that, that uh, cholera vaccine uh, needs to be targeted on. And as we're looking at uh, new cholera vaccines and as our lab and, and the Boston lab is looking at uh, ways to immunize through things like um, oral priming followed by a uh, intramuscular dosing uh, of a conjugate vaccine, we're really seeing whether we can trigger these better T cell responses on the mucosal surface. So I've got about 10 minutes left, and maybe I will quickly go through one of the epidemiology studies uh, that uh, I participated in. Uh, and so we looked at non-typhoidal salmonella gastroenteritis at our hospital over about 15 years' time. And th this is the reason why we want to look at it. So non-typhoidal salmonella, you might know it as just salmonella when you hear it on the news. It accounts for about 100 million cases of diarrhea disease worldwide. Uh, most of the press is on kind of high-income country outbreaks, so tomatoes or alfalfa sprouts or chickens or uh, from, a, from, a, from a large gathering. Uh, th those are a lot of the typical salmonellosis uh, outbreaks in high-income countries. But actually, the majority of the burden occurs in low-income countries, that even though the high-income countries get all the press, the low-income countries really have to suffer the most from these uh, non-typhoidal salmonella. There is also invasive disease, so sepsis due to salmonella. And this happens in Africa a lot, uh, in HIV uh, patients, uh, in those who have uh, in neonates. Uh, in, and and it, cause, it is the cause of up to 50% of bacteremias in Sub-Saharan Africa. This is now lower. Uh, we are seeing more typhoid salmonella. Uh, but either way, it's a cause, great cause of mortality in Africa. What we don't know is what's, what its status is in South Asia. The, the only burden estimate of non-typhoidal salmonellosis we have from South Asia is a Swedish traveler study calculating how many travelers from South Asia went back to Sweden with salmonellosis, uh, and then they were able to, then they kind of extended that calculation to what's really going on in South Asia. So we, we couldn't find, when we looked at this problem, we, uh, we really couldn't find any good data on on what uh, the or, or the burden of salmonella uh, in, in diarrheal disease in South Asia, uh, and most reports are local reports focusing on the bug kind of antimicrobial resistance or serotyping. So problem number one that we needed wanted to address was that there is limited data regarding EP of NTS in South Asia. The second problem is this: that in case control studies with acute diarrhea, that the high income countries suggest that the high income country studies suggest that 
NTS is highly associated with diarrhea. But when you look at locum studies, that it's quite mixed uh, data. That some studies found that there is just as much NTS in the stool of healthy kids as there are of sick kids, and some, uh, also, but some found that perhaps that there are more NTS isolated from kids with diarrhea. So what we identified as the second problem was that the risk factors and clinical manifestations of NTS infection are poorly defined in low-income countries. So what we set out to do was really describing various aspects of uh, non-typhoidal salmonellosis, uh, gastroenteritis, in uh, DACA hospital, uh, ICDDRB. What is really and has been going on for a long time at ICDRB is this systematic surveillance system. So since the 70s, they've surveyed every 50th patient uh, who came in with diarrhea, regardless of what kind of diarrhea they have. So they, by survey, I mean they take stool uh, they, to look at uh, over in parasites, you look for culture, for bacteria, they do a physical exam, and then there's a large questionnaire over a hundred questions questionnaire that ask questions like, how much do you make? Where do you work? Who do you live with? What animals do you live with? Um, do you own a TV? Uh, do, you, do you own a bed? Uh, what, where do you go? How far do you live from a health facility? So a hundred questions like that, uh, and this is administered to every 50th uh, patient. Uh, that, that really opens the door to examine a lot of different uh, questions that you might have related to diarrheal disease. So we identified patients with non-typhoidal salmonella as the only pathogen in the stool, so no co-pathogens by conventional methods. Uh, you might argue that if you use PCR on these stools, you might find 10 pathogens, but um, we didn't have that. Uh, and then patients, we can, the, our control group was patients with no pathogens identified in the stool, and we randomly selected and matched by month of admission because there are seasonalities to, to these bugs. And so by matching to month of admission, we f figured that some of these non-culturable pathogens uh, may occur at equal rates in control versus cases, and so it, it, it's probably less of a limitation, even though that is still a limitation. So first, we found that look, between 1996 and 2011, that there's tended to be a decreasing trend in percentage of patients who had salmonella isolated from their stool. Uh, that is, uh, in, in, in many ways, a good thing. Uh, that, uh, and we think it may be due to uh, improving hygienic standards. But we also fear it may be due to the availability of antimicrobials, antibiotics, uh, without prescription in pharmacies, and that their costs have been coming down. So bottom line is uh, the, the uh, salmonellosis have been downtrending over the past 15 years. We also looked at age, and we found that the large majority of uh, patients with salmonellosis were below the age of five. But then we scratch our heads and said, well, most of the patients that come in with diarrhea are below the age of five. So what you can take from this graph is that the bur largest burden of this NTS disease is in under age five, but not that those under age five are most susceptible. When we, the second graph is plotting the same age groups, but NTS is a percentage of all the diarrheal cases. So, in, so you know, it, it's kind of complicated to, to look at this, but what I'm saying is that one percent. So, so if a one-year-old comes in, there's a one percent chance that they have NTS. If a sixty-year-old comes in, there's about a two point five percent chance that they have NTS. And and this actually matches with what we know that the elderly have more compromised immune systems to handle salmonella, and and that the rates of salmonellosis in the elderly are, are maybe higher. Um, well, what about climate? Does climate influence uh, salmonella in Africa? There's one publication that said in dry season there's more salmonellosis, and in uh, another part of Africa it says the wet season. So we just wanted to look at it, what the situation is in DACA. And so when we plotted the 16 years um, by month, uh, we found that, and so that the red line is the rainfall, and and the black line is the uh, salmonellosis incidence. Uh, we found that July and August are peak months, and it really coincided with the monsoon season. So the, the rainy season in Bangladesh, as you can see from this graph, is May to September, uh, and really is right in the middle of that rainy season that we get the most cases of, of non-typhoidal salmonella. And when you look at temperature-wise, it is really during the hot season. The July and August is the hot season. Uh, the, t in Bangladesh, the hot season is most of the years, March to October. Uh, you, you may get down to 25 Celsius in the winter, uh, but in general, it's hot and humid. 
What about antimicrobial resistance? So since they culture all these patients, and they, they actually are able to also get antibiotic resistant patterns. And we found a few interesting things. We found that for, uh, for the old antibiotics, the first line, like ampicillin, chloramphenicol, and, and, and uh, trimsulfa, that, that resistance had, has been either declining uh, as for ampicillin or chloramphenicol, or stable as in uh, Cotrim or Bactrim here. Uh, I will, I'll jump ahead to ceftriaxone, uh, that rates of ceftriaxone ha have remained stable, which is surprising, but it's an injectable antibiotic. People don't really use it. But ciprofloxacin uh, resistance has really jumped up uh, since 2004. Uh, and it seems that if 2011 was a fluke year, uh, but and that in 2012, they continue to see a lot of cipro-resistant uh, salmonella. And this kind of data is very useful for clinicians uh, there. Uh, and and, and I, I really think that surveys like this uh, you need to be done at really country specific uh, uh, so country specific studies. We then looked at demographics, housing, animal exposures. This is a very busy graph, but it gives you an idea of the kind of question we ask. So um, we basically the only difference, the biggest difference we saw between those kids who or patients came in with salmonella versus those who had those who had no pathogens isolated, so likely viral causes, are that those with salmonella were older. Uh, there were no Big differences in um, kind of education, family income, uh, housing structure, so floor or roof structure, uh, how many had chickens or goats entering their, chi their kitchen. Uh, really, our hypothesis actually was that the more animals entered the kitchen, um, the more likely you're going to have of salmonella in your food. But that was not the case. Uh, and, and it surprised us, but uh, for whatever reason, it, it didn't make a difference. Uh, then we looked at clinical variables. So, you know, did they have watery stool? Did, did they use antibiotics? Uh, did you have abdominal pain or vomiting? And what was temperature? So the, the main difference that we saw was that salmonella uh, patients had uh, more abdominal pain and that their stool had uh, more mucus, pus, red cells, and macrophages. Uh, which is consistent with the fact that seminolosis is likely more inflammatory diarrhea, um, but uh, it's kind of good to confirm. Uh, the, the death rate seems to be about the same, and it was a statistical significant longer duration of stay, but when we applied the home bond for any correction, because we looked at so many variables, it was not significant anymore. Um, and just one last kind of piece of data is that in terms of bloodstream infections, we really don't see much of that in Bangladesh. Uh, we, we tried to collect as many cases as we could, uh, and really it accounted for less than 1% of blood, stream, blood culture positives at our hospital. So there are our limitations. Um, it's a hospital-based surveillance system, which means that you know, only the sickest come to the hospital. So we really don't know in the community whether what I've described to you is true. Uh, and only conventional assays were used to detect these uh, uh, bacteria, we didn't use PCR, we couldn't detect viruses. Uh, we actually did detect rotavirus, that's the only virus we detected through, um, through ELISA, and that a lot of these housing variables were self-reported. So to conclude, uh, this part of it is that um, that, that non-typhoidal salmonella are isolated in the stool of patients with diarrhea. Uh, most patients are young children, but rates are highest in the elderly. The highest rates are in the in the summer monsoon season. Uh, that there's resistance that's to CIPRO increasing. Uh, that Salmonella causes more clinical and microscopic evidence of gut inflammation, uh, and that risk factors include older age but not animal contact. So um, I so I want to acknowledge a lot of the people I work with from both Boston, MGH, Harvard, um, and ICDRB. I'm funded by the NIH. Um, ASTMH, Thrasher, uh, Harvard, uh, and NIAID. Uh, and just some conclusions that I wanted you to take away from this presentation is that first, that diarrheal disease is still a major cause of death and illness uh, in, in, in Bangladesh and much of the developing world, that there are still very large knowledge gaps in diarrheal disease. And I just gave you an example of two knowledge gaps that we try to address, that there are hundreds that we want to address, um, and that uh, international research organizations such as ICDDRB uh, provides an excellent infrastructure for, for patient care and investigations into, into epi, clinical, and basic science research. Uh, and that's all, and I think we have about five minutes to take questions. So thank you. Any questions?
Well, I'm going to ask a question. Um, with the introduction of cholera to Haiti, mm -hmm. how long do we anticipate that cholera is going to remain in the environment of Haiti and be a continuous problem and be persistent in Haiti? And so we're going to have to continue to monitor Haiti for cholera. <coughs> yeah. So, so it, historically, cholera has gone in pandemic. Pandemic. So we are in the seventh cholera pandemic, uh, and it's appeared in South America and it eradicated. So Haiti had, had a cholera for probably 100 years before it was reintroduced uh, about five years ago. Uh, and so I, environmental persistence is the problem, but uh, it can persist in the environment and then it can leave for whatever reason. Uh, but I think in Haiti the current problem is that there is uh, human uh, cases there that result in environmental contamination uh, and so I think with what got rid of cholera from Europe was improvement in infrastructure um, but I, I think now we have actually more tools than that we have um, infrastructure we can we can build infrastructure but uh, a lot of people think that that will take a long long time uh, but we also have the vaccine and uh, there are various modelers mathematical mo modelers who think that we can uh, kind of not I don't think they've gone as far as eradicate cholera from Haiti, but we can decrease the rates of cholera in Haiti if we are able to roll out a vaccine there. And there are some groups are doing that. Um, but I, I think we're in for quite a few years. And, and um, I, I'm not going to try to put my, a number on it, but um, the way the infrastructure is now, uh, it's hard to believe that we're going to get over this within the next decade. Other questions? Mm -hmm. I have a question. I was wondering if this was a possibility for making better vaccines. So from what you said, it seems like the cytokine response, the strength of it is dependent on how many memory cells are produced, right? It seems to be, yeah. So is it like possible to give something else in addition to the vaccine to make it so that that process of some of those activated cells becoming memory mm -hmm. cells is less stochastic? Yeah, yeah, yeah brilliant. Yeah, a absolutely. We're, so what we're working on is something called adjuvant, vaccine adjuvant. That yeah, so so it, it's very it's a very difficult field, um, and and oral vaccines is is, is they're they're been playing around with mutating various toxins that for example the cholera toxin or the um, uh, the LT of ETEC uh, to to mutate it in such a way that it's not going to cause you too much diarrhea, but enough that it will activate uh, T cells in the gut. So um, and and then the, in injectable vaccines, we're also looking at adjuvants to same thing, stimulate T cells, stimulate B cells um, in order to, to have better gut uh, and cytokine responses. Uh, and, and, and so, yeah, th that, that's the field that, that is, is pretty exciting, uh, but it's a difficult field. Uh, and and, and uh, there's, there's other ideas such as, you know, can you um, do some kind of combination oral injectable uh, dosing uh, and, and, and can you tie it in with another, you know, looked at tying typhoid vaccine with pneumococcal vaccine, um, can use the protein from one uh, in order to stimulate T cells so that the polysaccharide from another vaccine can be, uh, can have immune responses developed. So, yeah, no, that, that's, that's a good so idea. they use, like, less harmful infections or substances from that to, like, activate Yeah, the right. That's, activate the, that's the idea. Okay. It hasn't been played out in a, in a, in a vaccine, uh, oral vaccine yet, but people are working on it. As organizations like PATH are working on that right now. Because you could reduce the number of doses too, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. yeah, exactly, exactly, yeah. Okay, other questions? Yeah, please. Uh, you talked about how it fluctuated with seasons. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes some diseases were higher in monsoon season. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. What are sort of the theories along those lines? Yeah, great question. Yeah, so cholera, there's a pre-monsoon and a post-monsoon peak. The pre-monsoon, they think that everyone runs out of water in their water collecting uh, system, that they end up going to ponds, and which have cholera in them. And, and by the pre-monsoon season, it's the ponds have more warmed up, that there is pretty large uh, kind of concentration of cholera in the ponds. Um, and, and that's also when they run out of water. In the post-monsoon, they think that all the, uh, the, the water collecting, the, the clean water uh, reservoirs have been... Uh, have, have had wa dirty water dumped into them because of the flooding. So that's one hypothesis. Another hypothesis is that phages are seasonal, so um, the, 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 you, kind of you read into bacterial phages for cholera, uh, they seem to have a role in, in, in um, kind of the infectivity of cholera and also uh, 
how much cholera there is in the environment, and that those are if those are seasonal, uh, that uh, actually what we're seeing is the seasonality of phages uh, in the environment. So those are two hypotheses. It, I haven't seen anybody really um, confirm any of hypotheses, and I think it, it's it's still very interesting to me that different. So Kolkata is a few hundred miles away from Dhaka, and it has a different seasonality of cholera. Yeah. Yeah. Anything else? All right. Thanks. Thanks.